So Wache, my name is Jules Kostachin. I'm Cree from Ottawa, Piscot First Nations. Um, before I start, I just want to let you know, I just pulled my back out and I'm suffering from a flu that I just got this weekend. So I'll do my best and I'll try not to cough too much. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm from uh, Ottawa, Piscot First Nations. I'm a media artist, but I'm also a court and volunteer program manager at Elizabeth Fry Toronto. Uh, I'm pretty new there. I started in January. Um, we also have another Aboriginal manager who runs. Is that on? It sound like it's on. Okay. <laughs> we also have another Aboriginal woman, uh, Connie Hansenberger, who's running the residence there at Elizabeth Fry. So there's two of us there, which is really great. Um, anyway, uh, I've worked with uh, Aboriginal women in different capacities. I used to run On Day On Women Shelter for was it five five years, and um, this microphone's ringing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then um, went back to school and focused in on the arts. And is it working or is it just me? It's cutting. <laughs> it's it's like on the okay. Did you guys get all that or I have to start over? You got it? All right, that's good. Okay. So I, I used to run On Day on Women's Shelter. That was back in 1990, no, not 1990, 2000. And, Six, I think I left and uh, worked at Earl's, uh, Earl's Court Family Center. So I worked with Aboriginal people in different capacities. Um, so I'm happy to be at uh, Elizabeth Fry. So I am fairly new and I'm not a lawyer, but I'll share what I do know. But I wanted to give you um, an overview of what uh, Elizabeth Fry's uh, Toronto is. Um, but first, I'd like to say thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Audrey, for inviting me. And um, yeah, so like I said, I oversee the court and volunteer program. And some of the programs that we run, or the ones that I oversee, is the uh, volunteer program court service. And that's at the College Park Provincial Court. Um, and this program uh, has trained volunteer uh, court workers that assist clients through the court experience. So what we do is we offer support through the uh, court experience for, for women and men at times. Uh, we provide information and referrals uh, to community resources. And we also provide clarification of the court process. And we also give referrals to lawyers, assistance with applying uh, for legal aid. So we do a lot of work uh, within College Park. We also have a direct accountability program. And uh, that program is also located at College Park Provincial Court. And it's a preventative program um, using a restorative justice approach to ensure clients do not get a criminal record for minor offenses while, make amend while making amends for their criminal behavior which will most likely change with Bill, Bill C-10. Um, and this is done through the coordinated efforts of the Crown Attorney, Duty Council, Community Justice Worker, and the client. Um, so with the Community Justice Worker, through an assessment, determines uh, appropriate sanctions uh, to have the client's charges withdrawn. So sanctions could be uh, community service hours, which we do offer, like we do have people coming into Elizabeth Fry who do their community service hours there. Um, they can write a letter of apology, uh, financial compensation, or attend counseling programs. So these are some of the sanctions that uh, would be offered. So the community justice worker meets with the client when they return to court, providing emotional support, helps the clients with the necessary documentation to have their charges withdrawn. I'm just going to grab some water. <laughs> I also oversee um, the PAR program, and that's a mandated program, and um, it's a 16-week psychoeducational group program provided for women who are charged in domestic violence situations and who have entered a uh, plea in the domestic violence court system. Women are referred from the domestic violence court system and the probation parole office. So what I found interesting is I just shadowed um, a group, and. You know, when you're managing a program, you don't uh, get to work with the clients directly. But sitting there and shadowing, I was um, deeply moved. And I saw a lot of fear in the faces of the women. And they were mandated to be there. And in most cases, it's like from dual charges. So it was really hard to sit there and just see um, the women going through that mandated program and knowing the reality of a lot of their situations around being duly charged. Um, but anyhow, that's my observation. 
Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Elizabeth Fry. So Elizabeth Fry was an English woman born in 1780 into a wealthy Quaker family. And in 1812, she began visiting women imprisoned in London's infamous Newgate Prison. So appalled by the squalid conditions of poor women incarcerated with their children, Elizabeth Fry began services such as school for children and work projects for women where they can earn money for their release. Uh, she also advocated with government and public for female guards and better conditions. Her persistence and compassion led to real change for women in prison. So that's Elizabeth Fry, just a little bit of history there. Um, also, with the history of Elizabeth Fry Toronto, uh, in 1951, a group of Toronto women invited Canada's first uh, woman of parliament, Agnes McPhell, to meet with them and discuss recommendations made by Archibald Report, calling for change in the Canadian prison system, active in the struggle for improvement of penitentiary conditions and treatment of offenders. Agnes McFall's enthusiasm was the spark for the formation of the Toronto Elizabeth Fry Society, which incorporated 1952. Um, so I won't get too much into that, but um, so we've been involved in issues relating to the criminal justice system and the status of women in society, particularly where both are concerned. So Elizabeth Fry Toronto recognizes that the pursuit of justice and a fair and equal treatment for women in the criminal justice system is directly related to the greater pursuit of equal rights for all members of society. Um, so our agency programs, our staff are dedicated and our volunteers are pretty dedicated. We're all there and uh, we provide a wide range of programs for women who are or have been at risk um, of coming into conflict with the law. Our programs include homelessness and outreach services, residential programs, community programs, prison and court services. Um, so they all run at our main office, which is on Wellesley. Um, we have a Scarborough office and we work at um, Vanier Center for Women, Grand Valley Institute, Central East Correctional Center, and College Park. Uh, so we're kind of all um, throughout the city. Um, so we also have a community program. We provide a lot of um, programs for women like uh, financial literacy, incredible years, substance abuse assessment and treatment program, parenting program, mothers who care, shoplifting and fraud program, anger management, healing from abuse, community general counseling program. So we do, that's just our community programs. Um, and we have the homelessness and outreach program. And I used to run that program a couple of years ago when I was in school. Um, and then I came back uh, just recently for the court and volunteer program. Um, but the homelessness and outreach programs, um, those of poverty and homelessness are key reasons why many women who uh, become involved with the criminal justice system. So Elizabeth Fry Toronto recognizes this and provides a number of programs which specifically target, targets homeless women. Uh, outreach programs ensure women and community at large have access to information about the criminal justice system. Uh, we have the pre-employment program, um, so where a program assesses strengths in employment readiness uh, and exploring pathways to employment, employment goals that is unique to homeless women with a criminal record. Uh, Post-incarceration housing program, um, high demand, um, offers help to homeless women who have been released from prison and accessing adequate affordable housing. In addition, support is provided to enable women to maintain their housing. So we have workers who are working with the women go out and do um, viewings and support them throughout this process. Um, but it's very, very difficult um, finding uh, affordable housing. And uh, just my observation again is uh, when I was running that program, uh, staff would let me know that uh, at times, uh, uh, women felt they were kind of being pushed to um, live in a home where it's mostly men. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of subsidized housing available for them. Not a very safe environment. Um, so we have Project OWN, um, which uh, is Opportunities for Women Now. It's an education program that focuses on prevention and changing public awareness of issues related to women in the law. And we have a newcomer program, uh, provides counseling, support, education, and referrals to women ages 16 and up. Uh, we also have the WorkSafe program. Uh, the pro program is designed to provide counseling, support, education, and referral to uh, sex workers in regards to health and legal concerns and issues. So um, we have a halfway house, a residential um, home. And uh, I was talking to my colleague earlier, and I know Audrey wanted me to touch on um, Aboriginal youth, uh, Native women who are in prison. 
Um, but when I talked to my colleague, she had mentioned that, uh, I haven't done any research on this, but I just wanted to put that out there if anybody's writing a thesis <laughs> or doing some research, but uh, she was saying that uh, we have an aging Aboriginal population within the prisons and, um, you know, survivors of the residential school system and then staying within the institution and when they're released, they oftentimes reoffend. So, you know, there's a real gap services there. How do we provide services for this population? So that was just an observation that she had had that I thought was necessary to mention. So we have a transitional residence program for women on parole. Uh, from federal and provincial prisons, counseling resources, referral and support to assist women in their release planning. The residence has 11 beds and two satellite apartments for our mother and child program. Um, so for the past 39 years, a residence program on Wellesley Street has provided women a place of renewed hope and lasting change. What we also observe too is we have a lot of Aboriginal women who are coming into our residence as well. Um, so, um, just so you know too, the women who stay at our halfway house at a residence are on parole from provincial or federal, federal prisons and spend varying amounts of time with us. Um, it is their home during this critical period and um, in which uh, they ease into life outside of the institution and reintegrate into the community. Um, so, uh, that's a, like in a nutshell what our programs, I know it's a lot to kind of take in, but we do offer a lot of support at Elizabeth Fry Toronto. Um, and it's our belief that ensuring women with histories of severe uh, physical and sexual abuse and family breakdown acquire the skills and means to live with purpose and take courageous steps to rebuild their lives in a more effective um, than incarceration or detention with um, out bail. So um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to share the profile of an Aboriginal woman, and this is according to Correctional Service of Canada. So CSC describes the average Aboriginal woman in a penitentiary as 27 years old, education level grade nine, under or not employed, sole support mother of two to three children, and usually unemployed at the time of arrest. Um, and her history is described as left home at an early age. So this is all just kind of a generalization and this is what you know, their definitions are. Um, but uh, her history is, or her history is described as left home at an early age uh, to escape violence, subjected to racism, stereotyping, and discrimination because of her race and color, experienced sexual, emotional, and physical abuse throughout her life, likely to become involved in an abusive relationship again. So this is their profile of us Aboriginal women who are in penitentiaries. 